I'd like to uh, thank the Canadian Literature Centre. It's an honour to be back at the University of Alberta. And I'd like to acknowledge that we're on Treaty 6 land today. I'm going to start by reading a small vignette from an essay that I published in Alberta Views magazine because I think it sets the tone for my talk today, which I've titled Women Writing Winter. The essay is called Ahead of the Ice. October. I stand in line at the grocery store on a Tuesday evening. Outside, big fat flakes swirl to the pavement. It's late October, and this is one of the first snowfalls of the coming winter. Inside, tills beep and checkout girls chatter. Balloons with cartoon vampires and Frankenstein's monster float above tabloid magazine racks. I am here to buy baby shampoo. The rubber ducky yellow bottle promises no more tears. I am buying two bottles. One is for my four-month-old son, and one is for my mother-in-law. The cancer clinic suggests Shirley use an infant shampoo and an infant brush on her scalp as her hair falls out. Shirley is staying with us while she undergoes biopsies, lumpectomies, mastectomy, and now chemotherapy. The cashier looks at the two bottles and asks, is that everything? I nod. My mother-in-law was diagnosed with breast cancer the day I gave birth to my son. She sat on a plastic chair in a hallway that smelled of pine cleaner and waited for the second announcement to change our lives that hot summer evening. I held my frantic, vernix-covered, squiggling newborn to nurse for the first time and was in awe that both he and my body knew what to do. As the baby gulped up milk, I drank in his tiny nose, pink ears, and bow-shaped mouth. I was overwhelmed by this new little life that I held against my chest. I did not know that a new life, punctured with illness and loss, was also beginning for his grandmother. A mammogram three weeks earlier revealed a mass in her breast and a biopsy a week before confirmed the worst. Shirley got her news at 3.45 p.m. Ewan was born at 7.07. .07. That day, I felt proud and shocked at what my body had accomplished. I still can't imagine how betrayed she felt by hers. So I wanted to share with you that piece because it is one of the first creative writing pieces that I had the privilege of publishing. The publication of it confirmed for me that I was a writer and it introduced me to an audience. It engaged readers that I didn't know. People talked to me about it, they sent me emails about how they had read it in their doctor's office. It was my first encounter with readers who weren't my professors or my colleagues or my friends. And in, I think it really was my first encounter as being seen as an author. It came with it, of course, a huge sense of responsibility. It's a piece that is deeply personal and brings up issues around telling stories and laying my version of a narrative bare. I tried to balance empathy with the craft of constructing a narrative. I strive to write about something specific and unique enough to capture readers' attention, but to also do so in a way that readers can see themselves in someone else's mind, someone else's thoughts, someone else's body, even when it might be painful to do so. This essay ahead of the ice sets out the themes and obsessions that I have written about in all my creative work for the past decade. It, sh it shows the themes and intersections that I also want to talk about today. Women's experiences, the North, motherhood, bodies, and trauma. Almost all of my creative writing deals with these issues, including the creative nonfiction anthology that I had the pleasure of editing with uh, Sheena Wilson, who's also here at the University of Alberta. And so I've structured my talk today on this last week of January in an Edmonton winter around these the themes that I seem to return to again and again in both fiction and creative nonfiction. If my talk has a title, it is Women, Winter, and Writing, and you can place the commas where you like, depending if you're an Oxford comma fan or not. <laughs> but let's get properly into it. In the winter of 2006-2007, I was home on maternity leave, and my relationship to writing and reading changed. I wasn't working on an academic paper or preparing a syllabi or grading portfolios. 
I was consumed by the day-to-day -day needs of an infant and also being with my mother-in-law. One November morning, as my baby napped, I read the Edmonton Journal, when people still read newspapers. <laughs> there was an article that caught my attention. It was about a woman's remains found by hikers near Sutherland, Saskatchewan. What was unique about this sad story is that the woman's remains were found in an abandoned well and that police estimated them to be at least a century old. Since this woman's body had been exposed to water, it resembled the bog bodies of Ireland and Scandinavia. It wasn't the bleached bones you'd expect to find on the prairies after a century. Forensic work was undertaken and it was concluded that this woman was Caucasian. She had received dental work and she was wearing a crucifix of European gold, so likely she was a settler. I thought of all the women and women's bodies that I'd read about and taught and written papers about. Toni Morrison's Setha and Beloved, obviously Seamus Heaney's Bog Queen. Toni Kushner's Harper from Angels in America. Miranda in The Tempest, Eve in Paradise Lost. Lawrence Hill's Amanada in Book of Negroes. I became obsessed with this woman in the well, and I started wondering, what happened to her on the prairies? Where did she come from? What was her life like? Did anyone love her? Did anyone mourn her? How could she be alone for a century and have no one claim her? Obviously, there were some personal elements to my obsession. I had just been pregnant. I'd had a difficult birth. My mother-in-law was staying with us, and she was as I've said, undergoing breast cancer treatment. And we were in the beautiful but isolating, brutal Edmonton winter. My obsession turned into a writing project. I decided to research and write and work backwards, like a mystery of, source, of sorts, and try to imagine how this woman may have lived her life and how she may have ended up alone in a well. I decided to set the book in this area rather than Saskatchewan because I felt I could write more authentically about this area. Um, and the book takes place in between Lac St. Anne, Edmonton, St. Albert, and Athabasca. I'm interested in the history of this place that we live. I am actually from a little bit further north, a town called Beaver Lodge, but I've called Edmonton home off and on for the last two decades. I realized quickly in doing some research that I had to set my story after 1891, when the train came to Edmonton, to make it plausible that a European woman could be here, and just to make the story a bit less complicated. I quickly learned that the 1890s was not a great time in Edmonton. The fur trade was dying. People were dealing with the government's punitive harshness in the aftermath of Riel's 1885 rebellion. New settlers brought new demands and new tensions. It was the beginnings of reservation realities, and indeed the beginnings of the industrial genocidal project we now know as the residential school system. I made a decision early on in writing Pilgrimage to write Indigenous characters central to the book, not as caricatures or plot devices, but as complex central protagonists, even though I myself am not Indigenous. Ten years later, when I reflect on this book, I still can't believe I got into this project. But I wanted to write about women's lives. I wanted to write about childbirth. I wanted to write about motherhood. I wanted to write about love, about loss. I ended up setting the main story and the main characters in Lac Saint Anne. Lac Saint Anne has a very complicated and rich history. It, was a sa it is still a sacred gathering place and was a strategic trading meeting place for many, many years for indigenous peoples in this area. It became the site of a Catholic mission and indeed was Father Lacombe's first attempt at a large settlement. And when he realized that Lac St. Anne wasn't quite meeting his vision, he moved many of the families to what we now know as St. Albert. In Cree, Lac St. Anne's name is Manito Sakahigan. It was renamed Lac St. Anne for Christ's grandmother and the patron saint of childbirth. There's so much interesting history and such rich symbolism, I couldn't resist setting the book here. The book became my kind of love letter to northern Alberta, this harsh, beautiful, difficult place we all call home. 
So that winter that I started writing and reading and researching, I showed an early short story, my first foray into fiction in fact, to a writer friend, and he told me it was an absolutely terrible short story, but it would make a great novel. <laughs> I then realized I was writing a book. And that story actually, rewritten many times, became chapter two. Pilgrimage is a character-driven novel told from four different points of view. Makesis Adele Cardinal, a young Métis girl who finds herself pregnant by the HBC manager in the novel's opening pages. Moira Murphy, an Irish girl who has just immigrated and is a housekeeper for the HBC manager at Lac St. Anne. Georgina Barrett, the Anglo-Irish wife of the HBC manager. And Gabriel Cardinal, Makesis' brother, a trapper, an Athabasca River scowman, and the young man who falls for the Irish girl Moira. So just to give you a taste of what the book is about, I'm going to read the opening section. And aptly, it's titled Hibernation, December 1891. Outside the dogs bark and Makesis looks at the door. The young woman finds herself easily startled now. Makesis spends the winter days inside in the dark closeness of her family's log cabin trying to get used to the fluttering in her belly. It is the time of year when animals burrow and hide, the spruce trees are heavy with snow, and the naked poplars reach their spindly arms into the brutal, sharp northern sky. It is the time of year when it is hard to remember that in summer, Lac St. Anne is a place of light, hope, and possibility. Makesis quit working for the Englishman at the end of September, so the baby will come in late spring or early summer. At least it will be born when it is green and warm outside, she thinks. The barking gets louder. Makesis' mother, Virginie, puts down her mending and says in Cree, Our visitors must be here. Makesis watches her small, slight mother go to the cabin door. Virginie's hands shake with nerves as she opens it. Danse, come in, Virginie exclaims as she greets her cousins. This late December afternoon, Virginie welcomes Paisas Belcourt and Boots Majot along with Boots' husband, George, who have come visiting from St. Albert. Makesis knows they have journeyed all day through the snow to get here, riding in a Red River cart pulled by a donkey, to stay a few nights in this small cabin. Everyone will celebrate New Year's Eve at Lac St. Anne. It's colder than a witch's tit out there, exclaims Boots in Cree as she shakes soft snowflakes from the shoulders of her woolen shawl and stamps packed snow and ice from her boots. Well, come in and have some warm tea then, Virginie says, smiling. Her mother gestures to Makesis to take the kettle from over the fire. Virginie tells George, Luke and Gabriel are fishing down at the lake. There is hay for the donkey out back. George nods. He heads back outside without speaking or taking off his prized coat. The red, blue, green, and yellow stripes have faded over time, but the Hudson Bay Company colors felted into white wool still stand out. Virginie asks her cousins, what is happening in St. Albert? You always have such good stories. Makesis notices that her mother is fidgeting more than usual today. She wonders if Virginie is worried that Paisas and Boots are not, are not just here to celebrate New Year's Eve, but to assess her stomach for themselves. There are rumors, she thinks. It is hard enough to keep people's eyes off me at Mass, but has the gossip really traveled to St. Albert? Or did the auntie stop somewhere else on the settlement before coming here? Other women at Lac St. Anne may have noticed that Makesis no longer tucks her blouse into her skirt to show off her small waist. Makesis fears that some may chatter about her full breasts and hint of a belly just to pass the time. She has been told many times that she is beautiful, that she could pass for white and be married accordingly, and once they know, she fears that the women will feel slightly vindicated. She's no better than any of their girls. She is sad that she's causing her mother so much worry and hates to think about the shame her mother has not told Makesis' father, Luke, about the pregnancy, and they will only be able to hide it for another month or so. Makesis feels as trapped as the marten and muskrat that her father snares to trade at the Englishman's store. So as you can tell, Pilgrimage is a, a book that is very much about the difficulty of women's lives. And when it was published in the fall of 2013, um, as Daniel mentioned, the Edmonton Journal called it a work of frontier feminism. And I'll always be both very indebted and very cross at my friend Michael Hingston for coining that phrase because I'm not really sure what it means. But it's very interesting to try to unpack, right? Um, 
I was very fortunate to have a lot of support in Edmonton for the book. I launched it at Audrey's and then had a really lovely event that was hosted by the Onaway Public Library and Lac St. Anne Historical Society that was complete with a trapping demonstration and Métis jig dancers. I've also had the real privilege and pleasure of being invited to book clubs and I want to talk about that for a minute because I think it's really important. I've actually been invited to 28 people's homes to read and to talk about my book. And I'm really interested in book clubs as this female and domestic space. And of course, I realize there are intersections with class and privilege there. But it still, to me, is just so remarkable that people want to invite me into their home to talk about this book that I created at my kitchen table while my baby was napping. Right? That's, it's it's a, an aspect of readership and writing that I never anticipated, um, and it's, it's been a real honor. It's also come with some of its own challenges. Uh, the book is, as I said, very much about women's experiences. Um, I write about a same-sex relationship between a Métis girl and a Catholic nun. Uh, I write about multiple instances of sexual assault, and I tried to be really careful about showing the intersections of colonialism and male entitlement with what happens to women in those cases, but also not to make it a trope or not to make it a metaphor and to actually try to show that experience for the reader as a women's lived reality. Of course, it's also about childbirth, it's about miscarriage, it's about love. And I never really anticipated that when people invited me into their homes, they would share with me these stories of their own difficult pregnancies, miscarriages, sometimes about relationships, but mostly about these other experiences. And indeed, multiple women have, you know, over refilling a glass of wine and um, taking out a cheese plate, told me about their own experiences with sexual assault. And that, to me, has been uh, both something that I, I feel very honored that people trust me to share that with me, but it's also a really interesting relationship from author to reader, right? Because it's not something that you necessarily um, think is going to happen, and indeed I'm not a counselor, so at that point I just listen and feel honored that my story has inspired someone else to tell their difficult story. So publishing this book has been a whirlwind experience. I, uh, I've learned a lot, I've been humbled by the way that writing a book introduces you and welcomes you into other people's lives. I wanted to touch a bit on another aspect of the book. Um, in writing Alberta's history, I wanted to write about characters who don't typically appear in our textbooks or in our in our master narratives. And so all of my characters in this book are normal, everyday people in some way. I reference historical figures such as Father Lacombe or Father Lazé, who was the uh, priest at Lac Saint Anne around the time of the story. I mention Louis Riel in passing, but I'm not focused on those big historical figures. I wanted to write about the domestic and I wanted to write about everyday lives. In doing that, as I've said, I made a very conscious decision early on that I was going to have Indigenous characters be front and centre in the book and not props. And I realized that there is a difficulty in that because I myself am not Indigenous. I wrote about my anxiety and I identified my own privilege and my own history as coming from European settlers in northern Alberta in an essay that was included in the book itself and I felt that it was very important to do that. I was um, very lucky to have people in my extended family who were fluent bilingual in Cree. Um, I studied Cree when I was a student at the University of Alberta. I consulted with historians. Um, I even had to watch my father-in-law skin a weasel because he told me if I was going to write about it, I needed to know what it actually looked like. So, uh, but, but the fact is, um, you know, my my identity and my experiences obviously are going to have a lens on how how I write. And while I felt very confident in portraying how women are affected by motherhood and pregnancy and loss and sexual violence, as I've documented in the afterward to the, to the book, um, 
the inc incidents of racism that I portray in the novel are my imagined perspective. On that note, um, telling stories, I think, comes with an enormous responsibility. And I'm deeply invested in some very important and very difficult conversations that are happening right now in Canadian literature. There are conversations right now in our literary communities about how we deal with sexual assault in both the literary and academic worlds. There are conversations about how we reconcile identity, what it means to be Indigenous, and how indigeneity is defined by Indigenous communities. There are questions about who has the right to write which stories, and how celebrity culture and public intellectualism may influence how we re respond to some of these controversies. Well, I don't think my particular stance on these issues is relevant for this talk, I do want to say that these important conversations need to be listened to. And I wish we could do better at sharing information, at using social media to amplify voices that don't have access to traditional media. I wish we could do better at having meaningful dialogue without ripping people apart, or without having to expose personal trauma in order to be taken seriously in a debate. Writing to me is about creativity and expression and exploring histories to illuminate a present. It is also always about empathy. I think that as both a reader and as a writer, imagining yourself in the head, in the heart, in the body, in the life of another person, including someone completely different than you, is an act of empathy. Sometimes we get it right, and sometimes we don't. But I think debate and listening are crucial when we talk about stories, about writing. And it's something that I felt privileged to do in my classrooms here at the University of Alberta. And it's something I always try and frame my public readings with, whether it be a talk like this to a room full of people, or whether it be with three women in someone's living room. Indeed, we tell and we share the personal in the hopes that it might change the political. I wanted to talk a little bit about the Edmonton writing community today because I feel very fortunate to be invited by the Canadian Literature Centre as an Edmonton writer. As you'll notice, there are some amazing Canadian literary figures who give brown bag lunch talks. Um, Lawrence Hill last year, Ken Babstock last year, I believe, and upcoming Madeline Tien and some other really wonderful writers. And I just think it's so great to be here today to talk about the Edmonton writing community and to represent it a little bit, as much as I can. Um, Edmonton has a rich literary community and I know there are some wonderful writers in the audience. I saw Alice Major here, yes, um, and Rianne. And I think that uh, sometimes we, we don't acknowledge that or we don't, um, oh and Thomas, sorry Thomas, yes. Um, but we don't acknowledge that enough, right? We think that Canadian literature happens in Toronto or it happens in maybe Montreal or maybe Vancouver. But Edmonton is teeming teeming with literary talent and it's so fortunate that we have groups like the Canadian Literature Centre to profile and to share these experiences. I wanted to read a uh, final piece today that is from a anthology called 40 Below. It was published a few years ago and it's by, edited by local writer Jason Lee Norman and it was a really great example of Edmonton's literary community coming together to write about winter. Um, you know, what else are we going to write about? <laughs> um, but it also showed uh, a new way of promoting and talking and thinking about Edmonton writing that I think is really important. Indeed, it spawned a sequel anthology, and it also spawned a really interesting project where. Um, people's vignettes and little short micro stories are on coffee sleeves at independent coffee shops, so supporting local businesses as well. I wanted to uh, share this story, and in fact it's, it's going to take me to about probably 10 minutes, and so that will leave us a lot, a lot of time for dialogue and questions, which will be great. Um, and I wanted to finish my talk today with this story because it circles back to, the, again, these themes that dominate my creative work. women winter, and writing, and indeed Edmonton itself. 
So, thank you very much for being here. I hope you enjoy listening to it, and I look forward to hearing your own stories and questions after the reading. This story is called Sirens. None of her lullabies work. She soothes and rocks, sings and cradles, caresses her new baby with little result. He cries and fusses and won't fall asleep. The only thing that lessens the crying is when she bounces him against her body. She can't even go outside for a change of scenery. The sun hangs in the afternoon sky like bait on a fishing line. There is a deep freeze in Edmonton and more snow is projected for tonight. She is not supposed to shovel yet, it hasn't been six weeks since the C-section, and she's terrified of slipping on the ice while holding the baby and not being able to pull herself up. Her days are spent trapped inside a little house. It's her third winter here, and it is much colder than the first or second. Her first winter in Edmonton, she could feel surprise at how her breath froze in the air. She could see the beauty of Christmas lights peeking through the snow-laden branches of a spruce tree. She could find warmth by a fire with a cup of tea. But now, this winter, she feels it deep in her body. Her hip bones ache. Her pelvis is an empty cradle of cold. Her mind can't settle. Her husband tells her she feels this way because she isn't sleeping. She's nursing a newborn. She's just had surgery. She shouldn't be so hard on herself. But something is stopping her from feeling the way she should. And she wishes she could get the baby to stop crying so much. It's evening now. She feels relief as she hears the silver key turn in the door. Her husband is finally home. He might succeed in comforting their child. Besides an occasional nighttime interruption when their son cries for milk, his routine hasn't changed. He still sleeps most of the night, gets up in the morning, showers, gets dressed, eats his breakfast with both hands, drives to work, grabs a latte, and interacts with other adults until he comes home for supper. She suspects he doesn't believe her, that the little one screams and squirms in her arms most of the day. The baby always seems to settle when he gets home. Their son loves the sound of his father's voice saying, Hi, baby boy. Hello. Tonight, she decides it will be different. After her husband takes off his fleece-lined boots and hangs up his puffy red eiderdown, before he can say, Oh, those Christmas decorations are still up, and tentatively asks, How was your day? She hands him the baby and says, he's just been fed and changed, I'm going to have a bath. Okay, he replies, surprised by her decisive tone. When you're done, I'll need to go out and shovel the walks, it's snowing again. She nods. She leaves them and locks herself in the bathroom. She takes off the pajama pants and stained t-shirt she's been wearing for two days. The clothes crumple onto a cold tile floor like skin of a gutted fish. She smells of sour milk, baby powder, and nervous sweat. She looks in the dirty mirror and tries to recognize herself. The leaking breasts, tangled hair, deflated stomach, angry red scar below her belly button, they all seem to belong to someone else. She's a foreigner in her own skin. The first week or so, things were all right. Their son was born a day before New Year's Eve and they came home from the hospital on the 1st of January. Everything was new. She marveled at how the baby's tiny head fit in the palm of her hand. She loved the way he smelled of softness and warmth and purpose. She and her husband stared at his tiny hands and changed their minds hourly about whose nose or ears he had inherited. She came to know the mewing sounds he made as he woke up between naps. She loved how he tried to make himself small as she held him against her skin in the crook of her arms at her breast. She sang songs to him, every song she knew, carols about heralding angels and Jesus in a manger, Nursery rhymes about sailors who go to sea, folk songs about women who go to the market with red flowers in their hair. She felt the things she was supposed to feel. Then, one Sunday morning when the baby was nearly two weeks old, she woke up from a few hours sleep and things were different. The snowfall was suffocating. The baby's cries were a failure rather than an indicator. Her husband didn't understand. He suggested that they all bundle up and get out of the house and go for a coffee, but it didn't help. It seemed to be an insurmountable task to decide how many diapers to put in a bag and what blanket to use in the car seat. The vehicle's tires gripped at icy intersections and she braced herself for them to crash, even though there was no one else on the road. Once they got to the coffee shop, her husband told her to find a table, take some deep breaths. She put the baby still in his car seat on the table and pulled up a chair. Her husband brought over two coffees. She tried, she really tried. 
She wanted them to sit quietly in the wood and iron warmth of this cafe as the baby slept and share a moment. She wanted to look out the window and see the falling snow as beautiful. She wanted to be able to watch it cascade and swirl and blanket the world in cool white ambivalence. She wanted for a moment to feel it was only them and everything was all right. But it wasn't. A stranger's interruption to coo at the sleeping baby in, her car se in his car seat, the hiss of steam from an espresso machine, even Katie Lang singing Miss Chatelaine, all these sounds seem to really be whispers of danger, danger, you're not good enough. Even the green siren on her paper coffee cup seemed to grin at her in a malicious way. She just wanted to go home as soon as she left the house. She wanted to leave. She wanted to be somewhere where it wasn't winter, where it was warm. Tonight she slips into a tub dangerously full to the brim and lets the chrome tap run nearly scalding. She wants to burn the cold and sweat and fear off her skin. She wants water that isn't frozen ice or a suffocating snowdrift. She puts her big toe into the silver faucet and lets the water run down her foot. She tries to quiet her mind. She can't hear the baby crying, so perhaps her husband has succeeded where she has failed. She sinks into the water. This morning she listened to a man on CBC radio talking about polar bears and how they wandered into his village in Nunavut looking for food. The man's voice was sad. He talked about how there was less of everything. Fewer ice flows, fewer seals, fewer caribou. What struck her was her own helplessness. What could she do about the crumbling world she just brought a baby into? She should drive less, recycle more, give more to charities. What if a polar bear came prowling around their yard looking for food? Do polar bears come as far south as Edmonton? She has no idea. She doesn't have a gun as her husband doesn't hunt. She can't even get her baby to stop crying, let alone protect him from displaced polar bears. Soon, maybe the coast will erode, the Arctic will disintegrate, and they'll all be underwater. Perhaps her son will not have to worry because none of this will matter. She sinks deeper into the tub and imagines she is diving into the ocean's belly. She can taste salty water filling her nostrils and mouth. Her skin feels slippery. She wants to be quick and silver and liquid. She feels called to go deeper. She closes her eyes and sees waves crash against the shore. She wants the opposite of hard, cold whiteness. With each watery breath, she lets go a little bit more. She finally starts to feel warm. Honey, her husband has been knocking for at least a minute and he's getting frantic. Open the door. I need to know you're okay. She comes back. She lets her nose push through the surface of the water. She waits a moment and then slowly gets out of the tub. She ignores what is happening on the other side of the door. She stands on the plush green bath mat and watches water run from her torso down her thighs, over her knees and shins, and pool between her unpainted toes. She reaches into her husband's shaving kit and pulls out a small silver blade. It makes a neat red line across the inside of her wrist. It starts to pulse warm and red. Her husband pushes open the door with his body, breaking the flimsy silver lock. She stands there naked and dripping, her long black hair brushing the tops of her sore and crackling nipples, her wrist bleeding onto the green bath mat. She, he stares at her for a moment and then grabs the first aid kit from its place under the sink and finds gauze to quickly wrap around her wound. Hold your arm up, he says. She does. I, I had no idea, he whispers. He takes a blue fluffy towel from the shelf and wraps it around her nakedness. She wonders if he has imagined this possibility on his drive home from work. She wonders if he's lingered in the parking lot or taken a longer route home, fearing he'd find something like this. Why would you do this? She's silent. He pulls her close into him and she goes limp like a fish. The baby's asleep. I'm calling an ambulance. It's going to be okay. He strokes her wet hair. She's silent. The hospital will know how to help you. She watches the blood soak through the white gauze on her wrist. Keep holding your arm up. It's going to be okay. He sits her on the bath mat. She's never noticed that it's the color of seaweed. Stay right there. Don't move. I'll be right back. It'll be okay. She waits to hear the wail of the ambulance. She imagines its red lights flashing, glistening under the wave of falling snow. She wishes she were still under the water. Thank you.